Some folks like blues music and some opera. Some people collect Civil War soldier letters. I really like barbershops and photography. In fact, most people would say I'm obsessed by photography and by barbershops. Yes, the place where you get your hair cut, and yes, I know what you're thinking, that I could use a good cut right now. <laughs> and、uh, the, the interesting thing is that my mother, who's here in the audience, would say the same thing. And so, too, my favorite New York City barber, Elvin.、Um, we'll get back to both of them in a minute. My obsession with the barbershop began in childhood, and so with, my, and so with the camera. Um, here I am at around five or six with my father in the backyard of our home in St. Louis, Missouri. As you can see in the snapshot, my father wore a crew cut, and I most definitely did not. I think this photograph was probably made by my sister Jean, who would have been about 13 or 14. To、uh, keep his hair properly shorn, My father went on most Saturday mornings to the barber shop, and more than most other、uh, chores, I greatly enjoyed going with my father to the barber shop and、uh, to watch my dad get his hair cut and to take in the sweet smell of the aftershave lotion, to suck on stick candy, to see things I really should not, and to hear some things as well,、um, and every few months to get my own hair cut. Um, I was so short that the barber had to put a plank across the arms of the chair so my head was above the back of the chair.、Um, and、uh, instead of feeling so small or, or, or in any way、um, not in the right place, I felt empowered. I felt empowered because I was welcomed into this inner sanctum of adult male activity. And、um, it was an interior world that、uh, I. Understood was a secret society I probably should not share with my mother and my sister, and I did not.、Um, I, it was an, inside the joint where all the attributes a curious boy、uh, would want to see and to hear, from pinup pictures cut from men's magazines to off color stories told by those who were waiting for their time in the chair.、Um, the only matter I did not appreciate was my father's choice to have his hair cut. With an electric razor. I'm a scissors guy, and the nasty buzz of that machine tool really irritated me, and so too the burns on his,、uh, his scalp left by the machine. I made a solemn vow then to wear my hair long, and I've kept it ever since. I've always looked forward to every visit to the barber shop, and these days when I need a good haircut, wherever I am in the United States, I find the nearest barber shop. And I take out from my wallet a $20 bill and I show the barber this great. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, this great portrait of Andrew Jackson. No question, he has the best hair on American money. <laughs> and and、uh, for years I've tried to honor the president's modern style. And、uh, as my barber, Elvin, will tell you, I really don't need to say another word, I just give him the money. Uh, and it's a you know, real proof that a picture is indeed worth a thousand words.、Um, a barbershop is almost always a simple room. It's filled with a lot of mirrors and a lot of reflections, interior and exterior reflections. It has windows onto the street and usually a barber pole, a striped barber pole in front. Sometimes it's on the, on the curb, sometimes it's painted on the window. It's a kind of welcoming improvisational theater and a place of personal transformation. And beginning in childhood, I've always you know, spent a lot of time thinking about photographs of barbershops. Imagine what happened when I saw in a book this great photograph of a barbershop in the New Orleans French Quarter. It's a masterpiece from the celebrated photographer Walker Evans. As you can see, the photograph、um, subject is the doorway and the terrific painting surrounding it.、Uh, it was made in 1935 in one of the worst years of the Great Depression. And Evans took a job at that time in one of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal agencies. And the official purpose of the photographic unit was to provide, through the images of the camera, documentation of what the government was doing in their efforts to provide relief. To the struggling citizens. Evans, however, believed his purpose was not to propagandize 
for Roosevelt, but to distill from the simple and the poor and the ordinary the basic grammar of local life. And by doing so, what? To reveal something that was part of the unconscious American style, seemingly everywhere he looked. And on always undisciplined Bourbon Street, Evans made one of his most iconic and sophisticated photographs of a purely vernacular subject. Yes, a barbershop. He set up his large wooden camera in front of the doorway and framed a composition that contrast the off-kilter zigzag sort of piano keyboard stripes around the doorway with what's on the second floor balcony. It's a procession of neoclassical Greek lyre motifs that are in the railing. It's, um, it, it's also something that he looked at the barbershop's name, French Opera. Um, uh, the French Opera House was actually across the street from the barbershop until 1919 when it burned to the ground. Here's a detail of the photograph, and I think you can see clearly the bold patterns around the doorway and the shop's name, French Opera. Notice it says, haircuts, 25 cents, and so too, ladies' bobs, same price. The city never built another bar, excuse me, never built another opera house, apparently acknowledging what Evans had understood intuitively, that by the 1920s and 30s, the principal form of musical expression in New Orleans uh, was not classical music, it was jazz. And the photograph offers a resonant testimony to the historical importance of music in New Orleans, both European and old world and white, and quintessentially American and black. As for the imposing Creole woman standing in the doorway uh, in the striped blouse, Evan seemed to entice her to stand there, and whether she's a patron or an employee, she completes the photograph. She seems to have been a chameleon, in a certain sense physically transformed by the abstract motifs on the building's facade, as if by standing at the threshold of the barbershop, she has become one with the design. Moreover, she seems to invite us into a hidden world to share the intimate secrets and rituals of this darkened chamber. For me, it's a truly stunning work of art whose creativity and intelligence and complexity is embedded in what? Its straightforward documentary style. I truly believe that photographs are powerful storytellers in ways that even a child of five or six, or seven can understand. This is something that adults fail to remember. Or if they do, they demean the authenticity of the narratives found in these small images and often neglected works of art. Simply put, I believe that it is the photographer's art to record the everyday observations and moments and to show a deep, natural reverence for the real world. In the typical 1950s middle-class home in which I grew up, we had Kodak Instamatics and 35mm cameras, we had a black and white Polaroid, and even a stereo camera that made those three-dimensional images that required special glasses. Albums of family photographs were carefully arranged and annotated and then regularly consulted. They were studied for signs of identity for proof of family patterns and likenesses, and to answer frequent questions about and disputes about dead pet names and hairstyles. By around age six, I began to take photography very seriously, and I quickly wanted to control the process to be on the other side of the lens. This is a snapshot of my mother standing in a sliver of sunlight by our neighbor's porch. It is one of my first of the family portraits I made for many years. No one seemed to mind that I had stolen one of the Instamatics and had tried to begin this pictorial survey of my family and whoever came to visit us. Critically speaking, I'd say that this is my first photograph of any note. It's a portrait of the milkman delivering bottles. I don't remember his name, but I do recall the clink clink of the glass as he walked up the driveway with my mother's order. I can share these images with you today because, as a kid, I valued photographs so much, I began to collect and classify them and to organize them into albums and in shoeboxes. All sorts of photographs, from my own family pictures to postcards. Photographs have always seemed to me to be special things, 
magical, talismanic objects with both clear and hidden meanings. They were then and remain today material revelations of the real world that remind us all to pay careful attention to what's out there and to what's in here, what's hiding in our own thoughts and what's simply around the corner from where we're standing. Here's a photograph from one of my many visits to the zoo in the summer of 1968. It's of my friend Jane turning towards the camera at the lion and tiger show. The look on Jane's face still rocks me to this day, 45 years after I made the picture. And in her expression, I recall a kind of vague but intense lament that she and her family were leaving town at the end of the summer, never to return. I learned to pay attention to the details of the world through the camera, and yes, on those Saturday morning visits with my father to the barber shop. Here's a street scene in Vicksburg, Mississippi, from the early spring of 1936, of not one, but a pair of competing barber shops, the New Deal barber shop on the left and the Savoy barber shop on the right. Walker Evans made this picture of three customers waiting their turns in the chair. Or perhaps they're actually barbers waiting for their clients. We'll probably never know. What we know for sure is that it's a cool February morning and the strong winter sunlight beats down over the clapboards, creating what? Fine horizontal shadows all across the facade. It's a natural set of barber pole stripes, like those painted on the New Orleans photograph. And in front of this elegant stage, three Vicksburg men strike really natural poses. The overall effect is that of a perfectly illuminated theater set for one of life's most natural dramas. Walker Evans made this great photograph in Atlanta in 1936. In a city ravaged by the Civil War, he set up his view camera inside an African-American barber shop and focused on a pair of empty chairs. They were from the 1890s. They were really upholstered altars to one of life's most quotidian rituals. Throughout his 50 year and years in photography, Evans was often more concerned with things than with people. And rather than attending to the folks that Roosevelt needed for his propaganda, he paid respect to what? The barber chair itself as a vital expression of the community. African-American barber shops are like churches and were during the Great Depression, they are today, sites nurturing the spirit of a neighborhood, preserving natural and traditional folklore, and facilitating the dispersion of local news and gossip. In this now landmark photograph, Evans offers us the opportunity to enter this hidden world and even to take a seat. For me, the barber shop is a place of rich cultural value and the site for some of the medium's best photographs. I hope you too may now recognize the barber shop as an icon of the everyday, and photography a medium that explores the refined poetics of the commonplace by focusing on seeing itself as a creative act. As Walker Evans wrote in 1960, the year I was born, stare, it is the way to educate your eye and more. Stare, pry, listen, eavesdrop, die knowing something, you're not here long. Thank you.